Once, I saw a customer, years ago, damaging books in mum and dad's shop, tearing pages out, screwing them up, shouting things I couldn't understand. Mum was crying. Dad was furious. So was I. When customers are unhappy, they should ask for a refund, not go mental. These men are just as bad. They're hurting books cruelly and viciously and laughing about it. Why? Just because Mother Minka is a bit bossy. That's no reason to destroy the things she loves most in the world, except God, Jesus, the Virgin Mary, the Pope and Adolf Hitler. Wait a minute. Those wooden boxes the men are flinging around are the book boxes from our library. I get it. Mother Minka was complaining to us library monitors only last week that the library was very messy and needed a tidy up. She must have got sick of waiting for us to do it and called in professional librarians and professional library armbands. They've reorganised the library and now they're burning the books that are left over. No wonder Mother Minka was so upset. I bet she didn't give them permission to do that. Me and Mum and Dad would have taken those books. We love all books, even old and tatty ones. I can't watch anymore. I turn away from the smoke and flames and hurry down to Mother Minka's office. Rather than risk mentioning Mum and Dad out there, I'll wait for her to come back inside. I stand by her desk. Suddenly, a voice yells at me. It's not Mother Minka. It's a man's voice and he's shouting in a foreign language. I turn, trembling. In the doorway stands one of the librarians. He's glaring at me very angrily. This isn't a library book, I say, pointing to my notebook. It's a notebook. The librarian scowls and takes a step towards me. I'm confused. Why would Mother Minka call in foreign librarians? Perhaps people who don't speak Polish are faster library tidiers because they don't get tempted to read the books before they tidy them. Mother Minka hurries into the room. She looks very unhappy. I'm starting to think that this isn't a good time to ask her about Mum and Dad. What are you doing here? She demands. I can't tell her the truth in front of the librarian, so I try to tell her that I've come down to make sure none of the sparks from the fire blow in and singe her furniture or stationery. But at this moment, with her and the librarian glaring at me, I can't get the words out. Um, I say, I remember now, Felic, says Mother Minka. I asked you to come down and collect your notebook. Now you've got it. Go back upstairs. I stare at her, confused. Why is she calling me Felic? My name's Felix. I don't wait to try and work it out. I head for the door. The librarian is still scowling at me. Mother Minka is still looking very stern. But also, I see as I brush past her, very worried. Suddenly, she grabs my ear. I'll take you myself, she says. She drags me along the corridor, but instead of dragging me upstairs, she pulls the kitchen door open and bundles me inside. I've only been in the kitchen a few times before to trim mould off bread as punishment for talking in class, and I'd forgotten what a great soupy smell there is in here. I don't have a chance to enjoy it today. Mother Minka has shut the door behind us and is crouching down so that her face is level with mine. She's never done that before, ever. Why is she acting so strangely? Maybe whoever trimmed her bread for dinner last night didn't do a very good job. Dodi says eating bread mould can affect your brain. This must be terrible for you, she says. I wish you hadn't seen what they were doing out there. I didn't think those brutes would bother coming all the way up here, but it seems they go everywhere sooner or later. Librarians? I say confused. Nazis, says Mother Minka. How they knew I had Jewish books here, I've no idea. But don't worry, they don't suspect you're Jewish. I stare at her. These Nazis, or whatever they're called, are going around burning Jewish books. Suddenly I feel a stab of fear from Mum and Dad. When my parents sent the carrot, I say... Did they mention when they'd actually be getting here? Mother Minka looks at me sadly for a long time. Poor thing. Forgetting my name was bad enough. Now she's forgotten what Mum and Dad told her as well. Felix, she says, your parents didn't send the carrot. I desperately try to see signs of bread mould madness in her eye. It must be that. Mother Minka wouldn't lie because if she did, she'd have to confess it to Father Ludwig. Sister Elvira put the carrot in your soup, says Mother Minka. She did it because she... Well, the truth is she felt sorry for you. Suddenly, I feel like I'm the one with bread mould madness burning inside me. That's not true, I shout. My mum and dad sent that carrot as a sign. Mother Minka doesn't get angry or violent. She just puts her big hand gently on my arm. No, Felix, she says. They didn't. Panic is swamping me. I try to pull my arm away and she holds it tight. Try and be brave, she says. I can't be brave. All I can think about is one awful thing. Mum and dad aren't coming. We can only pray, says Mother Minka. We can only trust that God and Jesus and the Blessed Mary and our Holy Father in Rome will keep everyone safe.
I can hardly breathe. Suddenly, I realise this is even worse than I thought. And Adolf Hitler, I whisper. Father Ludwig says Adolf Hitler keeps us safe too. Mother Minka doesn't answer, just presses her lips together and closes her eyes. I'm glad she does, because it means she can't see what I'm thinking. There's a gang of thugs going round the country burning Jewish books. Mum and Dad, wherever in Europe they are, probably don't even know their books are in danger. I have to try and find Mum and Dad and tell them what's going on. But first, I must get to the shop and hide the books. Dodi opens his eyes wide, even though we're kneeling in the chapel, and meant to be praying. Jewish, he says. You? I nod. What's Jewish, he says. It's too risky to try and explain all the history and geography of it. I've already spent most of this prayer telling Dodi about Mum and Dad, and why I have to leave. Father Ludwig has just turned round, and he's got eyes like that saint with a really good eyesight. Jewish is like Catholic, only different, I whisper. Dodi thinks about it. He gives me a sad look. I'll miss you, he whispers. Same here, I say. I give him the carrot. It's fluffy and a bit squashed, but I want him to have it, because he hasn't got a mum and dad to give him one. Dodi can't believe it. It's just a whole carrot, he says. When I come back to visit, I say, I'll bring more. And turnips. I wait till everyone's gone to breakfast, then I creep up to the dormitory to pack. I pull my suitcase from under my bed and empty it out. The clothes I was wearing when I arrived here are much too small for me now, so I stuff them back into the suitcase and slide it back under the bed. Best to travel light. All that's left are the books I brought from home and the letters Mum and Dad wrote to me before the postal service started to have problems. I put the books on Dodie's bed. They're my favourite books in the whole world. The William books by Rishmel Compton, and Mum and Dad used to read to me. William was their favourite when they were kids too, even though Rishmel Compton isn't a Jewish writer, she's English. I used to think Mum and Dad were translating the words into Polish themselves, but then I found out somebody had already done it. I've always loved the William stories. He always tries to do good things, and no matter how much mess and damage he causes, no matter how naughty he ends up being, his mum and dad never leave him. Dodie knows I'd never give these books away forever. When he finds them on his bed, he'll know I'll be back for a visit. I pick up my notebook, tear out a clean page and write a note. Dear Mother Minka, thank you very much for having me. Please don't worry, I'll be fine. If possible, can Dodie have my soup? Yours faithfully, Felix. I put my notebook and pencil and letters inside my shirt. I'm ready. I peer out the window. The sun is shining brightly. The Nazis have gone. The courtyard is empty, except for a pile of smoking ash and a few charred books. If I'm quick, I can be out of here before everyone finishes breakfast. I hurry past the other beds, trying to not feel sad about going, and I'm just about to leave the dorm when someone steps in through the door and blocks my way. Jankiel. Don't go, he says. I stare at him, my thoughts racing. He must have overheard me telling Dodie about leaving. I remember him asking me about making up stories. He must want me to stay and teach him how to make up stories himself. I can see he's desperate, the poor kid. Desperate for something to keep the torture squad's mind off stuffing him down the toilet. You know how to make up stories already, I say. What? he says. Stories, I say. Half of St. Javiga's dorm still blubbering over that story you told them while you were queuing for chapel. About all the different ways you tried to get the dead horse off your parents. Cranes, tugboats, balloons. That was brilliant. Some of those girls were looking at you in that weepy, adoring way nuns look at Jesus. Really? Stankiel, sounding pleased. Here, I say, pulling out my notebook. Here's what a story looks like written down. Practice as much as you can, and you'll be fine. I tear out a page for him. It's a story where mum and dad hack their way through the jungle to a remote African village and help mend some bookshelves. Thanks, says Jankiel. He looks so confused and grateful. I know he won't mind if I excuse myself and hurry off. I'm wrong. As I move past him, he suddenly looks desperate again and grabs my arm. Oh no. If I try and fight him to get away, and he starts yelling, every nun for a hundred miles around will come running. Don't go, he says, it's too dangerous. I know what he means. If the nuns see me sneaking out, I'll be history, but I've got to risk it. I pull myself out of Jankiel's grip. There are Nazis everywhere, he says. I know, I say. That's why I have to go. Jankiel screws up his face and stares at the floor. Look, he says, I can't tell you what the Nazis are doing, because Mother Minka made me swear on the Bible that I wouldn't tell anyone. She doesn't want everyone upset and worried. Thanks, I say, but I know what they're doing. They're burning books. Jankiel looks like he's having a huge struggle inside himself. Finally, he gives a big sigh, and his shoulders slump. 
Just don't go, he says. You'll regret it if you do. Really regret it. For the first time, I feel a jab of fear. I squash it. Thanks for the warning, I say. That vivid imagination of yours is going to be really helpful when you need to make up more stories. He doesn't say anything. He can see I'm going. I go.